like Winston Churchill once said, you know, the Americans finally get around to doing the right thing after trying nearly everything else. <laughs> but I was crossing my fingers as I said it. Asia is where much of the 21st century is going to happen. That's why I spent so much time there. That's why my first trip as Secretary of State was there. Because we have to make it clear that the United States remains a Pacific presence and power. And we have to reassure our treaty allies and our partners from Japan and South Korea and Thailand and the Philippines and Australia that we are a reliable ally. Well, today, because of the government shutdown, because of the gridlock, President Obama had to cancel his trip to Asia. Once a year, the leaders of something called the East Asia Summit, which the United States was invited to join just two years ago, gathered to talk through issues facing the region. Russia's there. China's there. We're not there. Think about what that means to a leader in a country trying to balance the very big demands coming from China and increasingly from Russia. Buy our gas, buy our oil, open your markets, let us build a port, let us do this, let us do that. And the desire to balance that pressure <clears throat> with American presence. Now, most people are going to shrug when they say, okay, so the president couldn't go to some economic summit in Indonesia and some political strategic summit in Brunei. What difference does it make? In today's world, all of that makes a difference. It goes to how we are perceived. In the past, there wasn't so much awareness on our part or on the part of others about exactly what was going on, literally minute from minute. But with our interconnectivity, everybody knows what everybody is doing. And they particularly are watching us. American leadership is still wanted, but sometimes it's wanting. We don't understand how important it continues to be that our presence is felt. Now by contrast, in our finest moments, when we put the common good ahead of personal or political interests, Americans achieve such great things and provide a model of democracy that inspires people across the globe. When I became Secretary of State and started off on that first trip to Asia, the single question I was asked more than any other over and over again, and it continued for all four years, was how could I personally work with President Obama after the two of us had fought so hard in the primary campaign of 2008? People were genuinely amazed, which I suppose is understandable, considering that in many places, when you lose an election, you could get imprisoned or exiled, even killed, not hired the Secretary of State. And it is true, I was surprised when the president-elect asked me to serve, but he made that offer, and I accepted it, because we both love our country, and we both understand that in a democracy that's going to last year after year, generation to generation, that has to be the single guiding judgment about everyone who serves our country. And so I would say that. And I would tell that since our beginning, since we were blessed with a president like George Washington, we have tried to exemplify that kind of passing of the torch. And we've been successful. Now, I've spent a lot of time over the past four years in countries trying to make the difficult transition from dictatorship to democracy. And it's hard. There is no guidebook that you can take off the shelf. And people are constantly looking for clues. 
In Burma, for example, I talked for hours with generals who had taken off their uniforms and were trying to learn how to become presidents and cabinet members, legislators. And I talked with dissidents like my friend Aung San Suu Kyi, who were attempting to make the movement from protest to politics. I had many long conversations with her. She is a Nobel Prize winning icon, imprisoned in her own home, standing up for her people's future, for a democracy that she could imagine even though it seemed out of reach. She decided to get off that pedestal and run for office because she wanted to be in the arena where the decisions about the future were being made. I was so proud that people looked to us. They wanted to know how to set up their offices, how to be a legislator. I was in the newly built parliament in Napidao, the new capital, and the speaker of one of the two houses, he said to me, we have been studying your country and trying to understand how to run a parliament. And I sat up straight and I said, oh, that's wonderful. Have you been having seminars or workshops with experts? No, he said, we've been watching the West Wing. <laughs> in all kinds of ways. <laughs> but we need to get back <clears throat> to problem solving again in America. We have big challenges here at home, and at the top of the list is creating jobs and growing our economy, especially for young people. The young people of this country deserve to have the same kind of opportunities that I had when I graduated from college and law school. And I want to make sure that we, we try different ideas. We, we be creative because that's what we're best at, better than anybody in the world. Now here in Oneida County and upstate in general, there's been some recovery from the terrible recession, a new chip plant, if it's built in, in Marcy, will obviously create a lot of jobs and other jobs here and there that are being created or planned for. But we can see, we can see the effects of long-term economic dislocation. Good jobs with middle class incomes and upward mobility are hard to find. Wages have stagnated. The productivity of our workers has gone up year after year, but their incomes have not. One in four children here in Oneida County live in poverty. I want you to think about that. You're driving around or visiting your child's school, one in four are living in poverty. And we've known, of course, for years that the industries and the infrastructure that fueled growth in the 19th and 20th centuries are not going to be enough to create the jobs and prosperity we need in the 21st century. So we need new strategies for a new American economic revival. What I did as senator, what I learned right here in Upstate, is that we have to compete and thrive in the global economy, and we need to capitalize on our strengths, but we also have to be open to the world and export and find new ways of getting our goods and services bought everywhere. For example, when I began representing New York in the Senate, and I did my listening tour and I came right here to Clinton, there was a big disconnect between upstate and downstate. There were entrepreneurs upstate who were desperate for capital. And there were investors in the city who were looking urgently for promising projects, but they didn't know how to connect with each other. There were chefs and restaurant owners in Manhattan obsessed with local produce, and farmers in central New York who had never sold to anybody in New York City. 
So I make convening and connecting a priority, and we launched a farm to fork initiative. I brought a delegation of downstate food and wine buyers to an upstate tasting tour. We started a new tradition on Capitol Hill called New York Farm Day, where upstate producers had a chance to showcase their work. There's a lot to uh, eat and a lot to drink. Uh, and it provided opportunities for people to make connections. You kind of get out of that comfort zone and kind of see what's possible. And one of our regular attendees at Farm Day was Roxy Hilbert of Mercer's Dairy in Boonville. And the first time I ate Mercer's ice cream, I thought I'd gotten to heaven. It was so good. And in 2003, something unusual happened. Some of our farm day guests started pouring their samples of New York wine into their cups of Mercer's ice cream. And they loved it. And they kept trying new kinds of wine with different kinds of ice cream. Now, we could have spent all day trying to think of what's a new way of connecting Mercers with new markets, but people were doing that. It was spontaneous, and so we connected, you know, Mercers with the the wine uh, producers here in New York, and they started working together and coming up with you know cherry merlot and chocolate cabernet. And I just saw Roxy earlier today. They're now exporting to 20 countries. And it's the kind of strength we have here in upstate New York to take what we do well, make it better than anybody does it, and then be out there really pushing to make new markets, to make growth happen. Now, we followed a similar strategy to promote broadband and help small upstate businesses that never even had websites to begin marketing on eBay, for goodness sakes. They didn't have enough customers in the Adirondacks, but the world was out there waiting. Now, I mention this because when I became Secretary of State, I took this work and tried to embed it in the State Department, I called it economic statecraft. And I directed our diplomats to intensify their efforts to promote American companies, to cut through the red tape, to make it easier for our exports to reach new markets. I discussed it with foreign leaders nearly everywhere I went. Because every one billion of goods we export supports more than 5,000 jobs here at home, even more in industries like telecommunications and aerospace. And I was strongly supportive when President Obama set a target in 2010 to double America's exports over five years, and we are well on the way to achieving that target. It wasn't the government doing it, it was the government bringing people together to connect them up so that they could do it and take advantage of the reach of the American government. And I also stood up for our companies in places where they were being treated unfairly. We have the most open market in the world. And I believe it's imperative that we force other countries to reciprocate for our businesses. That when we take our goods there, they treat us the way we treat them. So we did a lot of work to open those doors. So we need to be thinking together again, not fighting the same old stale arguments, but finding a way to come together around this. And I worked with Republicans and Democrats, I worked with business leaders and labor leaders, anybody with a good idea. So let's think about how we're going to spur growth again. Let's make sure that equal work earns equal pay, that helping young people get the skills Priority. Let's do what we know will make us competitive 
again. So we have to roll up our sleeves and get to work. And the same is true for the challenges we face around the world. And that brings me to America's global leadership. Obviously, gridlock doesn't help us. Growth is an imperative because part of our leadership is rooted in the strength of our economy and the American dream. You know, for me, this is not even a question. We have to lead. I hear all the talk about, you know, America needs to pull back and not be so active. That's not the world I see. You know, when I was growing up, people were afraid that we were falling behind the Soviets in technology and ambition, especially after Sputnik. When I lived and practiced law in Arkansas, our country faced stagflation and oil shocks. When I became first lady, we were worried about outsourcing and a growing deficit and the apparent decline of American competitiveness. And each time, America, Americans, rose to the challenge. Our entrepreneurs and our innovators proved the naysayers wrong. We outworked, we out-innovated, we simply out-competed every rival.